Dear colleagues, welcome back on a weekly session on uh, US LCP. And this time we have a very eminent name. You have been uh, listening to him and you have been watching him on Facebook, on his uh, face page, where he regularly approached very interesting uh, uh, videos that he does in uh, Cairo University in Egypt. He's a great friend, Professor Hussain Akasha. He's going to uh, guide us on how to uh, stage a person who's suffering from some of the pancreas um, and uh, all yours professor say thank you uh, dear colleague i'd uh, like to welcome you all and uh, thanks for your interest in endoscopic ultrasound uh, today i will talk about one of the most important uh, uh, jobs or tasks of endoscopic ultrasound which is uh, its role in staging of malignant pancreatic masses Malignant pancreatic masses, uh, as we all know, may be adenocarcinoma, cystic pancreatic neoplasms, neuroendocrine tumors, lymphoma, metastasis. And the most common is pancreatic carcinomas. And the most common pancreatic carcinoma is ductal adenocarcinoma. It accounts for about 90% uh, of all pancreatic carcinomas. Uh, pancreatic carcinoma may be acinar adenocarcinoma, mucinous cyst adenocarcinoma, intraductal papillary mucinous carcinoma, serous cyst adenoma, pancreatoplastoma, solid pseudopapillary tumor, span or franz tumor, and the rare osteoclast like giant cell tumor. Pancreatic cancer constitutes about 3% of all new cancer cases in the United States and the number of new cases of the pancreatic cancer was about 12 per 100,000 per year. And the number of deaths were about 11 per 100,000 per year. So it is a very aggressive tumor. It is very aggressive tumor. And the number of cases have been rising on average of 0.8% uh, each year over the last uh, 10 years. And unfortunately, the five-year survival is very low. It is ranging between 5 and 7.2%, very low uh, survival rate. And we all know that the only hope for cure is radical resection. So early diagnosis and proper staging of cancer pancreas is very important to increase uh, this very low survival rate. So just after the diagnosis of cancer pancreas, the surgeon always asks the endosonographer this question. Is it resectable? But before you have an accurate decision for surgery, we must have an accurate staging. So let us talk about staging of the uh, cancer pancreas. This is the classic TNM staging of uh, cancer pancreas, uh, issued in 2010. T1 stands for tumor limited to the pancreas and less than two centimeter in the greatest dimension. T2 are tumors limited to the pancreas more than two centimeter in the greatest dimension. And T3 tumor extends beyond the pancreas, but without involvement of the celiac axis or the superior mesenteric artery. And T4 is for tumors involving the celiac axis or the superior mesenteric artery. And N0 no nodes, N1 uh, if there are regional lymph nodes. In 2017, some modifications uh, occurred in this uh, TNM classification. T1 is still tumors limited to the pancreas and smaller than two centimeter. If it is uh, smaller than half centimeter, then it is T1A. If it is between half and one centimeter, it is T1B. If it is between one and the two centimeter in the greatest dimension, then it is T1C. Stage T, uh, T2 is for tumors between two and four centimeters. And T3 are tumors larger than four centimeter in the greatest dimension. 
and T4 tumors involve, involve the celiac axis, superior mesenteric artery, and or common hepatic artery, regardless the size. We should stress in the term involves. What is meant by involvement of the vessel? Is it by touching the vessel or irregularity of the vessel at the site of the tumor or occluded vessels, thrombosed vessels, engulfed vessels, narrowed, compressed, obstructing the vessel, teardrop invasion, flattening? I think that is the most, all that are right, but I think the most suitable and the most accurate uh, item of uh, vessel involvement is loss of the interface, loss of the normal interface between the vessel and the tumor. This picture shows the normal line of interface between the vessel and the pancreas. This is the white line here, and there. this is the normal interface between the vessel and the pancreas. If this vessel is interrupted, infiltrated, become irregular or compressed, then there is involvement of this vessel. And this is the line of interface as appearing uh, in uh, radial uh, echo endoscope. This is the portal venous confluence and this is a splenic vein. So uh, this is a very nice line of interface uh, so here, this vessel is not involved. Let us see this very short video of a pancreatic body mass. And this is the venous confluence of the superior mesenteric and portal vein. Here we very nicely see the line of interface between the mass and the vessel. It's very clear, it is uninterrupted. So this vessel is not involved by this mass. But when we see these pictures, this is the portal vein and this is a pancreatic head mass, the line in, of interface is lost and becomes interrupted. And here there is part of the mass uh, pushing uh, or uh, extending inside the portal vein. So here there is loss of uh, the interface between the mass and the vessel. So this vessel is involved. And this is a pancreatic body mass, and this is aorta, and this is the celiac axis. And here we notice that the celiac axis wall becomes very irregular, compressed and narrowed with loss of the interface between the vessel and the mass. So here the celiac axis in, is involved by the pancreatic body mass, and the portal vein is involved by the pancreatic head mass. And this also invasion of the mass of the celiac axis. Here there is loss of the interface. And this is mostly invasion of the vessel by the mass. It is not a thrombus. Mostly it is not a thrombus and it is a direct invasion because this area has the same echogenicity as the original mass. So mostly it is a part of the mass. If it is a thrombus, it may be slightly hypoechoic. If it is recent thrombus, or slightly hyperechoic if it is an old thrombus. So, from a clinical point of view, the goal of the preoperative staging of pancreatic uh, cancer is to identify three different terms. When you do staging of a pancreatic mass, you should identify three different terms. Resectable tumors, that should be referred directly for curative surgery in surgically fit patients. Borderline resectable tumors that can be considered for new adjuvant chemoradiation for downstaging, then possible resection with or without vascular reconstruction. And metastatic or unresectable tumor that should be directed to the palliative chemotherapy. So the surgeons, or the attending doctor is waiting to hear one of these three terms for further management, whether resectable to send it for surgery, borderline resectable to send it for a new adjuvant chemotherapy for possible downstaging and further radical surgery later on, or metastatic or unresectable 
to send the patient for palliative chemotherapy. To determine res uh, the resectability of the mass, we should stress on determining three points in order to determine the resectability of the mass. The first point is which is the involved vessel? What vessel is involved? Is it the aorta, celiac axis, superior mesenteric artery, superior mesenteric vein, portal vein, or portal venous confluence? The second point is the pattern of involvement. The vessel is involved by abutment or encasement. The tumor is abutting the vessel or encasing the vessel. And the length of involvement, and this is very important for venous uh, structures, especially the portal vein and the superior mesenteric vein and the portal venous confluence. What is abutment or encasement? Abutment is involve, involvement of less than 180 degree of the circumference of the vessel, less than half of the circumference of the vessel. And encasement is involvement of more than 180 degree of the vessel or involvement of uh, more than half of the circumference of the vessel. If this is a vein and this is a cancer, then here the cancer is involving less than half of the circumference of the vein, while here the cancer is involving more than half of the, the circumference of the vein. Here, an example of abutment of the vessel by the mass. This is a superior mesenteric vein, and the mass is involving less than half of the circumference of the vein. This is the circumference, the whole circumference of the vein, and the line of contact uh, between the mass and the vein is less than 180 degrees. Yes, and this is the same patients here. The line of contact is less than 180 degrees of the circumference of the vein. The mass is present here, but it's not present there. So it is present at only one side of the vein. So here there is abutment of the vessel. This video showing encasement of the vessel involving of more than 180 degree or even the whole circumference of the vessel. This is the celiac axis. And here this is the mass and the mass is involving the whole circumference of the vessel. Here this is the mass, 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 mass. And here this is the vessel. So there is total encasement of the mass by the vessel. Uh, total encasement of the vessel by the surrounding mass. Okay, then according to the three points, the vessel involved, abutting or encased, and the length of involvement, we can determine the borderline resectable tumors. Regarding the superior mesenteric artery, abutment of the superior mesenteric artery for less than 180 degree makes it a borderline resectable tumor. If it is involving more than 180 degree, then it is unresectable. If it, it is not involving the superior mesenteric artery at all, then it is a resectable tumor. Regarding the common hepatic artery, if there is short segment abutment or, or encasement with no extension to the celiac axis, there is one centimeter free of tumor before going to the celiac axis. So there is one centimeter, the mass is uh, encasing or abutting the common hepatic artery, but uh, there is one centimeter free between the common hepatic and the celiac axis, then it is borderline resectable. If the mass is involving the common hepatic artery till its origin from the celiac axis, then it is non-resectable. And if it is not involving the common hepatic artery at all, then it is a resectable tumor. Regarding the gastroduodenal artery, if there is encasement up to the hepatic artery, then it is a borderline resectable mass. 
If there is a superior mesenteric vein or portal vein abutment, encasement, or short shed segment venous occlusion, but with suitable vessel proximal and distal to the area of the vessel involvement, allowing for safe resection and reconstruction, then it is a borderline resectable tumor. This distance of involvement uh, is judged by the, uh, or is suggested by the surgeons to be about two centimeters. If the area, uh, the length of involvement of the vessel is two centimeter or less, then the surgeon can do uh, reconstruction, approximating the ends with suturing or venous grafting. But if the distance is more than two centimeter, then it is unresectable. But it is reconstruction of the vessels will be difficult. But this centimeter is a subjective. It is left to the, circum the circumstances of the operation. If there are good collaterals, if this segment is involving many tributaries of the involved venous structures, so it, uh, sub, it is a subjective matter, uh, but uh, approximately two centimeter is the distance, uh, two centimeter or less is the distance uh, which you can do uh, vascular reconstruction. And of course, the celiac axis, aorta, and inferior vena cava should not be involved. If any one of these are involved by abutment or encasement, then the mass uh, will be unresectable. Let us see some of the videos regarding superior mesenteric vein and venous involvement. This is a large pancreatic head mass, and this is a pancreatic duct stent. Yes. And this is a CBD stent, pancreatic duct stent, plastic stent, and this is a large pancreatic head mass. And here, there is involvement of this vascular structure, which is a portal vein and superior mesenteric vein. This is the portal venous confluence as appearing from the pulp of the duodenum, as appearing from the pulp of the duodenum. This uh, area of involvement is about two centimeter or less, so it is a borderline resectable mass, and this is the superior mesenteric artery, it is away from the mass. The mass is not involving the superior mesenteric artery, but it is involving the venous confluence of the portal uh, and superior mesenteric veins. Okay, this is another example of borderline uh, pancreatic head mass. This is the venous confluence, this is the mass, and this is the venous confluence of portal vein and superior mesenteric vein. Yes, very nicely seen. This is the line of contact, the lens of contact between the mass and the uh, portal vein and the superior mesenteric vein, portal venous confluence. And we notice here that there is the line, the interface between the vein and the mass is lost. Yes, this is a superior mesenteric artery. It is away from the mass. But the superior mesenteric vein and the portal vein is abutted by the mass for a distance uh, less than two centimeters. Yes. And here we notice that in this area, there is complete loss of interface between the mass and the vein. Yes. Here there may be a, an interface is preserved, but here the interface is lost between the mass and the portal vein. This is an example of abutment of a borderline resectable mass abutting the superior mesenteric artery. This is the superior mesenteric artery coming from the abdominal aorta. Yes. And we notice here that there is abutment of the superior mesenteric artery by this large mass. The mass is present at one side of the artery 
and no, no, here there is no mass. So it is involving less than half of the circumference of the superior mesenteric artery. Here, that is an example of uh, complete encasing of the common hepatic artery till its origin from the celiac axis. This is the same patient. Here, this is the abdominal aorta and the superior mesenteric artery abutted by the mass. But here, this is the celiac axis coming from the aorta just above the superior mesenteric artery. And here, I will do anticlockwise rotation. Yes, yes, this is classic common hepatic artery going slightly to the right side of the screen to the hepatic hilum. It is totally encased by the mass till its origin from the celiac axis. Even the celiac axis is involved. So this mass uh, is uh, involving the whole length of the common hepatic artery. So this patient is unresectable. And here, this is the gastrodudinal artery. Very easy to diagnose the gastrodudinal artery because it is very near to the echoendoscope while scanning from the bulb of the duodenum. And here, the whole length of the gastrodudinal artery is encased. So it is a borderline resectable uh, tumor. Here, this is an example of involvement of the celiac axis. Involvement of the celiac axis by encasing or abutting renders the mass unresectable. Many societies agrees above uh, agrees uh, about uh, the previously mentioned criteria of resectability. Except there is a uh, MD Anderson stated that abutting of the abutting of the celiac axis by the mass by the pancreatic body mass renders it borderline resectable and not unresectable. All the uh, societies stated that abutment of the superior of the celiac axis renders the mass unresectable, except MD Anderson stating that abutment of the, of the celiac axis by a body mass renders it borderline resectable and not unresectable. So after completing uh, studying the staging of the uh, pancreatic masses uh, and the resectability of the pancreatic masses, two points left to be discussed. The first point is which is better for staging of the uh, pancreatic body masses? Is it the radial echoendoscope or the linear echoendoscope? There is no enough evidence to show a difference in the accuracy between linear and radial probes in cancer pancreatic staging, but keeping in mind the possible need to perform EOSFNA as a diagnostic tool, so the use of a linear probe should be more suitable. The second point is what is the weight of EOS in uh, cancer pancreas staging compared to CT and MRI. 11 well-designed studies compared between EUS and CT for preoperative staging of pancreatic cancer. Regarding the T-stage accuracy, three of five studies concluded that EUS was superior to CT and EUS also superior to CT in any staging in five of eight studies. That assessed its, its accuracy. Which is better, EUS and MRI? Both are equivalent for any staging and vascular invasion. 
MRI had a sensitivity of 15% and specificity of 93%, and US has a sensitivity of 36% and specificity of 80% for in staging. Regarding vascular invasion, MRI had a sensitivity of 59% uh, uh, and specificity of 84%. And the US has a sensitivity of 42 and specificity of 97%. So US have a heavy weight in evaluating, staging, evaluation of vascular invasion and resectability, and the ability to do instantaneous, easy, and safe tissue sampling. This is my last slide showing the very nice algorithm for the workup of cases of pancreatic masses for detection and staging of pancreatic masses. First, we do multi-detector CT scan or MRI. If there is a pancreatic mass and it is clearly unresectable, then we may do ERCP if there is obstructive jaundice in cases of pancreatic head mass. And we should do EUSFNA to obtain cytopathological diagnosis for palliative chemotherapy. And you should consider celiac plexus neurolysis if there is pains. If there is a pancreatic mass which is clearly resectable and the patient is fit for surgery, the patient should be sent for radical resection. Here, EUS may not be needed. If there is a pancreatic head mass but it is equivocally resectable, we should go to EUS for more determination, for more accurate determination of resectability of the mass. And if the mass is resectable, it should be sent for surgery. If unresectable, we should do EUS FNE for uh, palliation. If the CT showed non-pancreatic mass or equivalent, or equivocal mass, especially in cases of obstructive jaundice, we should do to the more, we should go to the more accurate endoscopic ultrasound. If there is a resectable mass, then we should send the patients for surgery. If the mass, if there is a mass and it is unresectable, we should do FNE uh, for palliative chemotherapy. So I came to my conclusion. It is very important to stage borderline resectable pancreatic tumors for possible new adjuvant chemoradiation for downstaging and possible vascular reconstruction during radical surgery. EUS, multi-detector CT and MRI are the available tools for tumor staging. However, the possibility to obtain samples from the suspicious lesions or lymph nodes by means of uh, EUS FNA makes this procedure an ideal diagnosing and staging modality for pancreatic cancer. And thanks for your attention. Thank you for your attention. And shukran in Arabic, danke in Germany, merci in France, tashakurat in Turkey. I don't know whether the Pakistan language is here. If it is here, then thank you very much for inviting me for this uh, nice uh, presentation. Uh, Professor Kasha, thank you very much for an excellent talk. I have a comment and a question for you. The question is, uh, the question that we get asked by our surgical legal colleagues is about the conventional or unconventional arterial anatomy. Now, obviously I can see in your hand, uh, despite you as being a 2D modality, you're able to accurately stage the cancer. So question is, are you, how con confidently can you answer the que question whether a patient has a conventional arterial anatomy or not, for example, the cases where they have a replaced right hepatic artery. Another question obviously that I think has, that we've learned over the years is whether the patient has a, um, this median awkward ligament syndrome, celiac artery stenosis or not. So those are the, the important consideration when the information is being provided to surgical colleagues, especially when they're making a decision uh, for, 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 a, for, a, for, for a very high risk surgical modality. And the comment, uh, I think, in terms of the algorithm was, I agree, I think EUS uh, should come before any um, invasive intervention, especially endoscopy intervention of ERCP, uh, as there are cases where an ERCP intervention could convert a, a, a resectable cancer into an unresectable cancer. But fantastic talk, and thank you very much.
Yes, regarding the question, you are very right. The accuracy, the accuracy of uh, endoscopic ultrasound in staging is uh, 85, 85 to 90 percent in best hands. So there are long, long staging in about 15 percent, uh, and this is also for CT and MRI. So you are totally right. But uh, I think this is for hepatic artery is uh, slightly a little bit more difficult to stage the hepatic artery because the common hepatic artery is rather difficult to visualize from the duodenum, from the duodenal bulb. It is better to visualize from the stomach and you should trace, you should do a hard job of tracing the celiac axis from the aorta and then common hepatic artery and then, then it's bifurcation into gastroduodenal to the left of the screen and the hepatic artery proper to the right of the screen. So I think the hepatic artery is uh, uh, a little bit uh, difficult, uh, but uh, screening the uh, 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 visualizing uh, the superior mesenteric artery is much more easier. Uh, portal venous conference is much more easier. You can visualize it from the bulb uh, of the duodenum and the stomach, and uh, but uh, you are totally right. Uh, overall, at, at the end, the accuracy of uh, US staging is uh, uh, is about eighty five percent. But you are deceived. But the very huge Japanese uh, fighter that <laughs> this is not one hundred percent, of course. But you are totally right. You are totally even in best hands. The accuracy of AOS in staging is about 85 to uh, 90 percent, especially uh, in common hepatic artery and uh, the hepatic artery proper. In, in the, uh, the same lines, uh, uh, the, uh, the way we in the United States, we say is like EUS and CT scan, they are really complementary to each other. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, combining both uh, give you much better uh, uh, staging as compared to either modality alone. EUS is uh, uh, two-dimensional. Uh, in CT, they are making a lot of progress. Technology is making a lot of progress. They can reconstruct the images. And uh, CT sometimes does better at especially arterial uh, um, involvement or uh, um, uh, anterior, uh, arterial evaluation. Where EUS still does much better job is the portal vein confluence and SMV because that is uh, uh, still in our domain uh, of EUS. We can take a really uh, better look at that. No, not that we can't uh, do a good job at SMA or celiac, uh, but I think uh, at, uh, at the end of the day, uh, advancement in technology has brought CT either very close or maybe even uh, uh, ahead in uh, uh, certain uh, 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 circumstances uh, with regard to staging. So for us nowadays in the United States, we do uh, comment on vascular involvement, what do we say? But it really is a, a combination of the CT scan and EUS to have the final staging of the patient. Yes. This is a, a, a question to all the panelists. A very common scenario, that's the reason that I was asking if Saad is there. Most of, the, most of the times in Pakistan, patient comes with a report for sound with a bilirubin. Yes, I am there. Uh, and we do a CT scan on day one, and on the following day, we are expected to do ERCP. Sir, isn't it a common scenario? Uh, yes, uh, we ask. And it depends and varies from the surgeon to surgeon, I think. This is what I suggested there because I think there's, there's no cutoff uh, bilirubin uh, that, that I am aware of, to be honest, because we are dependent on our surgeons. If the surgeon says, I'm not going to operate on this patient, um, with a bilirubin of 15, uh, then then you then you don't have a choice but to go in and and put a stent. Um, and and sometimes the patient wants to you know think about surgery. Uh, there are one one has to remember the results of Whipple's are different uh, in in I'm sorry but in different parts of the world the experiences are different. So. One has to be very careful when one is actually uh, advocating one modality of treatment or the other. Uh, size of the tumor, by the time, like you said, uh, by the time we get the patients, they're usually pretty late. I, I haven't seen any patient with uh, T1 or T2 of pancreatic uh, you know, uh, growth. They're, they're almost always four centimeters or above uh, quite often. And um, 
the one thing that i wanted to also add is that sai khalid just said i feel that ct scan has less operator is less operator dependent but eus is very operator dependent very nicely shown by uh, people like khalid and, uh, and professor uh, they are obviously very good um, someone like me i am not very sure i am i'm very good at uh, taking care of i mean i'm very good at commenting on uh, on 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 the vascular involvement in pancreatic disease to the extent where i can say well you know what i can challenge the ct scan and so hence we also feel that you know here in our part of the world we, we tend to um, be more dependent on ct scan if it is done properly and reported properly i understand there is variability there as well. Uh, in Egypt, uh, surgeons ask for uh, CBD stent uh, before surgery if the bilirubin is more than 12 uh, milligram per cent or if there is cholangitis. But if it is uh, no cholangitis and the bilirubin is uh, below uh, 12 uh, milligram per cent, then they go for surgery and uh, spare or uh, avoid the uh, ERCP. This is the usual practice in Egypt. John, you want to say something? Yeah, the, the, the data on the bilirubin came from that uh, Cahen study, didn't it, from the uh, guys in, in uh, the Netherlands. Um, but it, it, it was basically picked out of the air. So they used the, the, or the, the same as we, it was 300, I can't remember what that is in the milligrams per mill, but um, they picked 300 and they said above that, you won't be able to enter the study. Below that, you get randomised to upfront surgery versus uh, stent or, or and surgery after, and showed that the stenting was associated with worse outcomes. But that number was not based on anything particularly scientific. They just picked a number and went for it. And unfortunately, that's then filtered down to a lot of our colleagues who now think if it's over that level that you should then have a stent put in first. What we don't actually have is great data on what happens. There's a little bit. So Keith Roberts from Birmingham done some work on. Um, upfront surgery in, in Aberdeen where he used to work. Basically, if the patient had good renal function and was fit, it didn't matter what the bit of region was. So if they were fit enough for surgery and their renal, because the renal function you worry about, if the renal function is reasonably okay, hasn't completely ruined their clotting, then they would take them to, to theatre with, didn't matter what the bit of region was. Um, and interesting, we always talk about cholangitis in tumours. I don't know what most people's experience is, but if you can't get something at the uh, the level of a molecule out through a stricture, you're not going to get something the size of a bacteria back up it. Um, the most common cause of cholangitis in cancer patients is uh, uh, when someone's bundled an ERCP. So we've, we've got him put a bit of contrast in, haven't got decent drainage, and we've then infected what was a sterile system. And um, most of us that get cholangitis are the ones with stones in, i.e. they're already dirty, and then they get obstructed, and then they, they get infected. So, you know, we often get pressured by people, oh, they're going to get cholangitis. Like, no, they're not. <laughs> um, or it's not that common that they get cholangitis. There's more time. I think what um, uh, uh, Professor Akasha has said is really valuable. There's plenty of time to think, right, okay, you know, the bilirubin is 5, 10, whatever it might be. Get the right information so you're doing exactly the right thing for the person. Don't have the pressure to get, unless it's really clear they're not going to have surgery then don't just leap into an ERCP. We, we did a study showing that uh, the stents get in the way of uh, staging and they definitely get in the way of getting a decent biopsy. So all of the things that you, you want to know get ruined by putting a metal stent in if that's the first thing you do. So if you've, if you've got time, which you have, and um, you know, look at the staging, do a PET scan. We do PET scans now a lot in the UK. They're very, very useful. And um, you know, get in the US, prior to the ERCP and if you can do EUS and the ERCP in the same sitting so we bring them down to the department do the US do the staging do the biopsy switch to ERCP do brushings and the stent and then they've had everything done and we've, we've done it without the tumor being messed with first up which we just think is really useful and fantastic so thank you very much Right. That is very true. Like these patients with the mass uh, malignant obstruction, they don't develop cholangitis unless somebody, uh, there is an instrumentation or there is a stone there. They do not have cholangitis because of the malignant obstruction. That is very true. So with these clear messages, uh, I think if there's no more comment, no more question, it remains for me to thank Professor Okasha for a wonderful presentation, for a wonderful uh, interaction. And... Uh, is similarly, thanks to all the panelists, thanks to all the attendees who have spent the time to uh, make this uh, program successful. Uh, I'm also thankful to Wilson Pharmaceutical for providing the platform. So see you next week. Take care. Uh, Allah, bye-bye.